Are you ready for a good and trusty raffle? <laughs> hello, recording friends. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you're new. Hello, welcome. Hi, my name is Mel, and today we're gonna be talking about all the books I read in June. My June wrap up, all of the books that I've read recently, and this is also going to include the two lonely books that I read in the month of May because I didn't really feel like reading in May. It was a weird month. I was moving. I really wasn't focused in reading. I was focused on me, my life, and just everything in general, and I didn't want to pressure myself into reading. My best policy when I am going through what we call a reading slump is to not read. And I stuck to my word, I stuck to my advice, and I'm going to include those two books here in case you guys want to know my thoughts on them. May was pretty much empty. June, on the other hand, was a really good month. Arguably so? I don't know. I feel like if you guys follow me on Goodreads, you'd be able to go on there and just look at all of my recent reads and think that I have descended into madness, which I kind of did a little bit because it kind of did feel like a lucid dream. Like it genuinely felt like a fever dream. And after that, I went into huh, a long period of a <clears throat> rest and relaxation, if I do say so myself. Look at me with the puns. They're really bad. And before we get started, let me know in the comments what you guys read in the month of June. Any books in particular that you enjoy that you'd recommend? Any new favorites? Let a girl know all of that down in the comments. And this is also your gentle reminder that if you're experiencing a reading slow, don't ever feel pressured to read, okay? Great. I need a reminder of that too sometimes. We're gonna get right into the books that I've read in the past few months. Starting off kind of rocky with books Book Lovers by Emily Henry. This book I just have a love-hate relationship with and I just don't know what happened here. The premise of this sounded super cool. We've got these sort of rivals, I guess you could say, though they're not really rivals either, so it's just confusing in the way that the book was pitched. We've got one book editor and one book agent, and these two individuals are the top notch of both of their industries. However, going into this, I didn't know more than that, and also this book is pitched as a romance, and it's not. I would argue that this book is a contemporary with a very romantic subtone. The book is romantic because it just romanticizes relationships and it romanticizes family and it just romanticizes life as romances and contemporaries tend to do. However, this book at its core is not a romance. We follow our main character Nora and she basically is a workaholic. She works to live, she lives to work. That's just the cycle of her life and she has a lot of fear and I think it's that fear that drives her to work as much as she does and because because she works so much, her sister Libby designs this whole plan to take them both to Sunshine Falls, which is a small town, and further teach Nora how to romanticize life, literally, and how to love the little things, and how to take time off, and how to enjoy going out for a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, or how even going to a bad diner can be a good thing. And it is there that she re-meets Charlie Lostra, which is somebody who she already knows due to work. Ultimately, this is a story about sisters, a story about about sisterhood, a story about PTSD and grief and how that can come into your life and affect your different relationships, how sometimes the loss of a loved one can shift dynamics in your family and really make you behave differently with your siblings or with your loved ones. And to call this book a romance when the majority of this book spends its time exploring that sisterly dynamic, exploring the shift in dynamics in family members and just exploring everyday life things. I I don't think that branding this a romance is fair because even though there is a romance between Nora and Charlie, it really isn't at the forefront of the story. Did I think they were cute? Yes. Did I think that the banter was great? Yes. Did I think that the book was actually funny in the parts that it intended to be funny? Absolutely yes. So I think this book had a lot going for it. I just think marketing wise, it was very misleading to call this something that it's really not. But all in all, it was a three star for me. Kind of right in the middle. Next up on my roster, I've got Cleopatra and Frankenstein, one that I actually really, really enjoyed. I had been seeing this book all around. I think this book was plaguing my Instagram, like quite literally. And I picked this up and I was not disappointed with this. And so we basically follow Cleo, who is a British painter, and she comes over to the US to study. And lo and behold, at the start of the book, her student visa is actually about to expire. It's about to end. And right when that is happening, she's got a few months left of it. She ends up meeting Frank who is 20 years older than her and who, in her words, is everything she is not. She is a struggling painter. She is the embodiment of the 
struggling artist archetype. And he is sort of the opposite. He is self-made and he has really made a name for himself in the industry that he works in. He owns his own company and they sort of strike this bargain of sorts that they would get married in order for Leo to get her visa, her green card. I don't know what you get when you get married to an American, but whatever you get, that's what she wanted. And so they make this deal. They get married on a whim, literally, and they start life together after that. And they didn't really know each other very well. It was mostly just a physical connection. And so the bulk of this book is really us exploring the dynamics within their marriage after they make this very rash decision and how they slowly but surely as the relationship progresses fall in love or believe that they're in love. I think the view on that is going to be different per person, but you really do get to see the beginning stages, the struggling stages, and how these two are constantly pulled apart by different circumstances. They seem to fall under the category time and time again of an age gap is a significant thing sometimes. And while that may not be the case for everybody, it really is for Cleo and Frank. They are very, very distinctly at very different periods in their life. Frank is very established, Cleo is not. And although they don't like to hold it against each other, I do feel like the internal dialogue that we experience sometimes reinforces the fact that they are slightly salty, I guess you could say, based on what point of their lives they're at and how that contributes to their ongoing dynamic as the book goes on. And so it's not only the fact that their age gap is pretty significant that is pulling them apart at times, but it's them meeting different people that they connect better with, friends that are toxic, friends that the other doesn't get along with, dishonesty, codependency, but also not wanting to depend. And so a lot of their relationship is just a walking contradiction and in a way that I think was very eloquently written. I think it's a heartbreaking but realistic story about marriage, about life, about an age gap romance, about discovering who you are as an individual and sometimes giving parts of yourself for others. And so all in all, I think it was a really, really great read. I ended up giving it four and a half stars. And this was, after Book Lovers, the book that finally kicked me in the butt and got me into reading. And after Cleo and Frank is when I descended into the madness of literary fiction. And I next read Convenience Store Woman. And this book, I really, really, really enjoyed. Now we follow our main character, Keiko, who is a convenience store worker. And she literally lives to work at this convenience store. She loves it. She loves the feeling of security that it brings her. And she loves the sense of normalcy more than anything that it brings into her life. Now, I think what I love the most about this book is that it has neurodivergency rep without outwardly stating that Keiko is neurodivergent. And you can constantly see that in the way that she addresses the reader, in the way that she talks in this internal monologue, where she wants to feel quote unquote normal in terms of societal standard. And she just wants to feel like part of the world in the way that the person next to her is. And really the convenience store is the only place that does that for her. And I also think for Keiko in the story, it was a great place to be. She quite literally gets to observe people on an everyday basis and see how they interact with each other. She gets to see how people react. She gets to have a routine like life while still bringing in a level of excitement and something new. And in turn also see what her daily life looked like with all of these stigmas and the lack of understanding for neurodivergency with her family not really understanding who she is as a person and really not trying to understand either, but rather her family and the people surrounding her putting Keiko into a box because it is the easier choice rather than educating themselves and really understanding Keiko as a human. And so it was honestly really insightful without outwardly stating anything. And I think that's why I enjoyed this so much because I got to read in between the lines. And I've said this before, but it's really infuriating to me when I read a book that doesn't give the reader enough credit. I feel like this book gives the reader all of the credit. The ending of this book also very much reminded me of Black Mirror, where it felt so just overt and crazy and just what the hell just happened. And I loved that. I loved how it was almost nonsensical, but also made all the sense in the world. It was just literally the best of both worlds. I can't remember if I gave this four or five stars. I am leaning towards a four though, because there are things in execution that I do think would have been explored better if the book would have been longer. My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfeg was next. And this was a book that I also really, really enjoyed. I initially gave this four stars and then I bumped it up to five stars just because this book has kind of stuck with me ever since I finished reading it. And I think the concept of this is just very interesting. For the entirety of the book, we've got an unnamed main character. We'd never find out her name. We just know that she is here and she is selling the story. And this 
this is essentially an exploration of somebody who has everything and yet is not happy with their lives. We've got a main character who is pretty, who's got a really great boyfriend, who's got the friends, who's got the money, the very high education, who literally has anything and everything she can dream of, but still, despite having quote unquote everything, she is not happy. And we explore the reasons why, and it is explored through this literal year of rest and relaxation, in which our main character believes that by heavily medicating herself and sleeping for an entire year, she will be able to sleep all of her problems away and wake up a year later and everything will be basically magically fixed. Obviously, we know that that is not a thing, that is not possible, and so we end up exploring this medicated haze in which our character is in and everything that comes with it, all of these hallucinations and all of these memories that come back to her, which is exactly what she's escaping, and it almost has this tone of no matter how much you try to run from your problems, no matter how much you try and run away from trauma, there is a time when you're not going to be able to avoid it and you're going to have to face it head on, even though you may not want to. And so it has this sense of inevitability as you read the book where the main character doesn't want to address the trauma and she doesn't want to address the PTSD and she doesn't want to address all of these mental health concerns. And because she is so medicated, she has no way of escaping them. And so it ends up being really interesting, but also a really, oh, I don't even know what word to put to it. I don't want to say weird read, though it is odd as you read this because the main character is unlikable, but at least in my experience, the fact that she was unlikable made me like the book more because I feel like we've got enough likable characters. I've got a whole library full of them, but this just felt new and fresh and different. And the way that it was written also was just so unlike anything I'd ever read before that I was very much in it for it. So I gave it five stars in the end. Another book that I talked about in my litfic video, which I talk about more in depth in, but it was really interesting. And after that, I read a very emotional read and that was My Dark Vanessa. Now, My Dark Vanessa really hit me in the feels, hit me in the gut, I cried, I sobbed. It was just a very, very emotional ride. And there are several trigger warnings for this book. I will make sure to either put them on screen or list them down in the description or put a link to it so that you guys can go look them up if you are interested in picking this up. But it is still an exploration of something as I found out Litfic essentially is. Every book that I've read in Litfic just tends to be a conversation about something, which honestly is quite enjoyable, but this is an exploration of the psychological dynamics in a relationship between a very, very young girl who is in high school and a teacher who is very well in his 40s. And we have alternating timelines in this. So present time in this book is 2017, and then the past is in 2000. So we start out the book in the year 2000, as our main character Vanessa has convinced her parents to go to this very prestigious private school. It is a boarding school. And so they ship her out to this school, she arrives there, and from the year 2000 all the way to the year 2017, we get to see the start, middle, and essentially end of Vanessa's relationship, quote-unquote relationship. I don't like calling these relationships, though they are, with her English teacher, Jacob Strain, a man who quite literally groomed her, a man who made her believe that she was in love with him and he was in love with her, and it's just a very icky feeling that the book gives you as you read, especially when trying to explore psychologically the dynamics and the remnants that a situation like this can leave for people. So it was honestly a really heartbreaking read to just experience all of these things with Vanessa. Even in her adult years, the grooming that took place when she was young was still very much in place. And it was very uncomfortable to experience, I think, especially in audio format, because it just feels a lot closer. I don't even know. I feel like I'm struggling so much to talk about this book. So I'm just gonna let Pasmel do her thing and like talk to you guys about it as I was reading it, because I literally cannot articulate this book today. I just, I don't know what's happening, but my brain, my brain, my brain is just not. So I'm just going to refer you to my Litfic reading vlog if you want to know like coherent thoughts, because as of now, I have been trying to talk about this book for too long without articulating anything coherent, but it was a five star. And this is where it went downhill for that video, because I read Milk Fed by Melissa Broder, and this book was not it. You guys need to see my reactions for this book, because I could not believe what I was reading. I could not believe my eyes or I could not believe my ears and what I was hearing and also reading with my eyes. It was just the weirdest experience I've ever had with reading a book. I just need to give you guys a synopsis and like not talk about this book anymore because I literally just want to wipe this from my brain. We follow Rachel, our main character, and Rachel has an eating disorder, although an eating disorder is not something she wants to admit that she has. She lives under a 
very strict regimen on what she eats. It is very restrictive in terms of calories and she is very much just obsessed with portioning out her food in a way that is very small, very specific. However, she ends up meeting Rachel at the yogurt shop that she goes to. I can't remember if it's every day or every other day. It's part of her routine. She likes her yogurt a very particular way and she ends up meeting Rachel and she ends up being really smitten by this person. She loves her and her body and just her persona and everything that she stands for. And so the two spark up a relationship and then the book just descends into madness. This book is so sexual and I don't mean that in like a weird way. I've got no filter. You're not gonna find me out here being like hee 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 kissed her. It was weird because when you say feed me mommy so that I may live, this girl thinks that vaginas should taste fishy. She is disappointed when they're not fishy. I'm like girl you're not gonna get any omega-3 from any coochie okay and I was very frustrated with this because I would have loved a story that actually addressed and explored the very nuanced conversation of an eating disorder and how that affects somebody on a daily basis I have struggled with disorderly eating before and it is fucking terrible especially when the people around you don't really understand eating disorders or when there's so much stigma around eating disorders I just I would have loved an actual serious conversation an actual good book about it but this though I understand that maybe it didn't want to be too heavy but it was too heavy regardless because who be out here with whose kumquats I just no if I could rate it negative 10 I would if I had your face by Frances Cha was another lit fic I read and I promise we are nearing the end of Mel's lit fic era however this book was interesting I liked parts of it and then by other parts I just wish we would have gotten more I feel like if this book would have had a hundred extra pages it would have greatly benefited from them but I think all in all the commentary that this book brings on a lot of things was really fantastic and so in that regard as far as commentary goes I was smitten by this book. So we basically follow four women who live in the same building. All of them have very distinct lifestyles, very distinct lives. We've got Cutie who is very very stunning and she works at a saloon entertaining men after hours. We've got Mijo who's an artist who works very closely with the elite. We've got Ara who is one of the most entertaining POVs. She is a hairstylist and she is obsessed with the lead from a k-pop band and lastly we've got Wana who is pregnant quite literally with a child that she cannot afford and honestly the conversation surrounding beauty standards particularly in Korea was immensely interesting I think particularly because we got Kyuri as one of our POVs it was super interesting to see her as somebody who works in a business where her body and her face are so important she has undergone a lot of physical surgery a lot of physical alterations in order to do better at her business and so she is trying to become successful at the expense of herself and who she is and so I think all in all the commentary about misogyny and class and money and beauty standards was all very very interesting in this book however the ending felt kind of flimsy for me it felt kind of inconclusive and I just wish there would have been more to this so I feel if this book would have been a hundred pages longer this book could have honestly been like a 4.55 star but it was still a very interesting read curious to reread again to see how that could potentially impact the way that I feel about it because I do feel like I could rate it higher if I read it at a different time and this not being diluted into a million other lid fix I was reading at the time but give it three stars again middle of the road a little life I don't know what to say about this book anymore because I literally uploaded an hour-long video talking about a little life I will link it down below in case you guys want to watch this because I just laid it all out there as you can see it made sure to take good notes for the video and then it was just a reading vlog for the memories quite literally but this book is just it is just this book exists and this book is here in this plane of existence and it is here to mess with everybody whether in a good way or a bad way it depends on how people receive it I was personally sort of middle of the road with this I gave it three stars I genuinely thought there were things that have taken out of this book it wouldn't have changed the outcome of it I don't think this book could have been written with half the traumatic stuff that is in here and the author could have still told the exact same story so it almost felt like the author was going to extremes in order to justify the end and so in a little life we follow a group of four friends JB Willem Malcolm and Jude all of these people again have lived very different lives with very different levels of success we start out the book with Jude and Willem moving into a new apartment it is not the best area 
again, not the best apartment. However, it is all they can afford at the time. And we've got alternating timelines in which we get to see them as they meet in college, all the way up to their very adult years, in their 40s, in their 50s. And we get to see every nook and corner of their lives, really. And I think that's what this book really does really well, is that the understanding that we get of these characters is above and beyond. You really get to know every single part of them. You get to understand why they act the way they do. And it really, by the end of it, feels like you lived their entire lives with them. And so in that regard, I think the book is very successful. But beyond these four friends, we follow more closely Jude. Jude, who at the start of the book is very mysterious, and then we slowly but surely get to know everything that has happened to him throughout his life, and why at the start of the book he is at the point where he is at, and why at the end of the book he is at the point where he is at. Immensely painful, if I do say so myself. Very triggering for a lot of different reasons. Again, I will refer you to the A Little Life reading vlog if you wish to descend into madness with me and into tears with me, if you have read the book. And if you haven't read it and you don't plan to read it and you just want to get spoiled, go ahead. The entire vlog is spoiler filled, but I talk about this book a lot more in depth there. So I will just leave it to speak for itself. And then after all of that pain, I read one of my new favorite books and that is The Atlas Six by Olive Blake. I ended up reading this five stars. I need to start off by saying that because this book was literally so good. We follow six magical people who all have different abilities as they are being recruited by Atlas Blakely, who is a part of the Alexandrian Society. Every once in a while, the Alexandrian Society chooses the best of the best in each area of magic to come and learn about the society and potentially be initiated into the Alexandrian Society. However, there is a catch to this because there are six, but only five can be inducted. And who will those five be? This book reminded me so much of Middle Game, which as you guys know is one of my favorite books of all time. I think it mixes science fiction and fantasy so seamlessly together in a way that feels whimsical and poetic while still being gritty and dark and that is just something I love about these two books. I also think similarly to Middle Game but more so this is one of those books that you're reading and by the end you are left thinking did I understand everything? No but did I still love it? Yes I did because the characters in here are all so terrible. They really really are. They are not good people. They are willing to kill and lie and manipulate and destroy in order to get what they want and that is a spot in this society. The fact that all of these characters were morally gray pushing onto the bad side of things, how none of them really got along with each other but they had to push past their differences to work together anyway because they really didn't have a choice. But you could tell that none of them liked each other but despite that there was still a deep admiration from some of them, I won't say all of them but some of them, into the other people's abilities. And so it reminded me of heroes with this dark-ish tone, a very diverse group of characters, and just some crazy shit happening. The twists and turns, also that sense of inevitability and time. It is just something that I enjoyed in Middle Game that I found myself enjoying here as well, and it was just everything. And Olive e. Blake's writing is just absolutely phenomenal too. A thriller I read and ended up loving, because this was another five stars, is In My Dreams I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead. Now, what? a fucking book. This book was literally so good. We follow six college friends in one college reunion and one unsolved murder. And that is honestly all I recommend you knowing before walking into this because it's also similar to the Atlas Six. All of these people are not necessarily bad, but they are all morally gray. They've all got something to hide. And the way that they are brought together to figure out what exactly happened to Heather, which is the girl that died when they were still in college, is just so good. Like it's honestly, I said this in my 48 hour readathon vlog, but this book genuinely felt like the Spider-Man meme where everybody was pointing fingers at each other. And it felt like a game of Clue because nobody really knew what was happening and everybody had something to hide. And so therefore everybody suspected each other. Listen, people are friends up until they got to throw somebody under the bus for murder is all I'm going to say, because they were so quick to be like, <gasps> murderer. And I love that the main character, Jessica, is the 
best vessel for the story. She almost gave me Black Swan vibes, the movie, Natalie Portman, one of my favorite movies of all time, because she was such an unreliable narrator. You could tell that there was such a power imbalance between her and others and her and herself. It almost felt like because she had such an inferiority complex, she wanted to behave superior to others. And it was just so wild to experience because now as a grown adult, she is going to this college reunion because she just wants to prove herself better than everybody else. And so following her in this story was just out of this world. And we also get alternating timelines between the present time and when they were in college. So we really get to experience all of their dynamics with each other. We get to experience all of their relationships with each other and exactly where the jealousy and where the obsession and where the approval and where all of these things came in and how exactly it all led to the murder of Heather. It was just so good. It was just so phenomenal and I can't wait to read more Ashley Winstead. And last but not least, I have got On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden, which I didn't really love. I gave this three stars, leaning towards like a two star. I'm still unsure about this because I was very, very much confused and I think I got it because I read the synopsis and also just because at the end I had to do the whole red string thing in my brain and just really try and comprehend what I'd read. But I was really disappointed by this because it's so long and it just had such a great opportunity to explain things better than it did. And so while parts of this were interesting, I was just very much confused in the majority of this graphic novel. So we follow a restoration crew that literally travels across the galaxies, the universe and everything to rebuild structures that can be functional for the people of the now. The synopsis literally says that it is to piece the past together, but like what past? When was it ever figured out? When was it ever pieced together? Because there was nothing about this that was trying to piece the past together. They would just say, oh, this used to be an old office building and now it's gonna be this. That was it. I don't think it ever really explored the past of this world, of this universe in which the graphic novel resides in. And so I was just really confused because I was trying to understand exactly how this world worked, what powers people had, because powers were mentioned and nothing was really being explained. And then we'd get a little bit of world building and then just vibes and then a little bit of world building and then no vibes. And so it was a little too all over the place for me. I will say the relationships in this book are truly just what shine. However, at times I do feel like they were being clouded by everything else happening, but the relationships in this, Mia and Grace and Elle and Alma and everybody on the screw, like all of these relationships were stunning. It is filled with LGBT characters, which I loved. We've got sapphic romances, we've got a trans character. And so all in all, the rep in here is great. And the relationships in here are really beautiful. I just love the loyalty and the acceptance. And at the end, that sort of recognition of even if we're not together anymore and I don't love you in the way that I used to, I still care about you. And we don't have to be together in a romantic relationship for me to pick up on you and see how you are and just see how you're doing and just make sure that you're okay. And so at the core of this is love and I loved that. But the world in which it is set is confusing. And so the relationships were great, but I was confused <laughs> by the world. <laughs> and the world was most of this. So I just, I don't know. And that is it for today, friends. That is my June wrap up. Those are all of the books that I read in June. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this. If you did, don't forget to smash that like button down below and to let me know down in the comments. What did you guys read in June? Did you enjoy the books? What are your new favorites? Maybe some disappointments. Just let me know all of it down below. And if you reach this point of the video, let's leave some spaceships down in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. I am constantly uploading videos. I'm sure you don't want to miss. And if you want to support the channel further and just support ya girl and what she does and just join in on the fun because we've got a book club, a discord, exclusive content, reading sprints, live shows, all of the above. I do have a Patreon and it's always linked down below alongside all of my social medias. I love you guys so, so much and I shall see you on the next one. Bye guys!